Who are some of the most heartless criminals who would probably scam their own mom? Let's find out, starting with... Number seven, just for shoes. Two fraudsters targeted senior citizens, swindling them out of nearly $600,000. The heartless duo, Tavoy Malcolm and Lorindo Powell, had a slick routine. They'd call up these sweet elderly folks and tell them how they won the lottery or some big sweepstakes. But there was a catch, of course. The victims had to fork over some cash for taxes and fees to claim their supposed winnings. One victim was a 77-year-old lady who was promised a financial windfall, but instead of riches, she was taken for a ride. Powell took over the con after it was started, relentlessly pressuring her to pay up. The fake tax payments made the woman fall behind on her mortgage, and the payments she did make were sent to Powell after he convinced her he'd handle everything. The missed payments caused her to eventually lose her home, forcing her to rent a room. Then there was a 91-year-old woman who got caught in the same sweepstakes trap. Malcolm and Powell convinced her to write checks and hand over control of her bank accounts. Then they went on a shopping spree for designer shoes with her credit card, spending over $10,000. Powell was finally caught and ended up with a 51-month sentence. In total, Powell scammed five senior citizens, including a 90-something woman living in a New Jersey retirement home, and a Maryland couple with dementia who he took for over $120,000. While Powell claims to have changed their ways and offered an apology, prosecutors said what jumped out most about the case was the total lack of remorse Powell displayed. Do you know anyone who's been hit by this scam? Tell us about it in the comments. Number six, the Jamaican lottery. Don J. Williams, a Jamaican man from Montego Bay, got nabbed for being a part of a Jamaican lottery scam. He was charged with conspiracy, wire fraud, and money laundering, the syndicate he works with called him a lead broker, the middleman who traded in what they called sucker lists, lists of people that scammers thought they could easily trick. Sanjay was the only one among a group of 32 to take his chances at a trial, while a dozen others were chilling in Jamaica waiting for their turn in the hot seat. The group ran their scam like this. Scammers would call unsuspecting people, mostly older folks who were just going about their business. They'd tell them tales of winning millions, but there was a catch, because there's always a catch. The victims had to fork over some big bucks for taxes and fees. Edna Schmidt is an elderly lady from North Dakota. She got a call saying she'd won a cool $19 million and a brand new car. All she had to do was pay up on the taxes. But the problem was this so-called winning process dragged on until Edna had lost her entire life savings of around $300,000. Edna eventually contacted the authorities over the situation and ended up bringing the whole thing down. The investigation that followed exposed over 70 people who'd been scammed out of a whopping $5.2 million. These victims came from all walks of life, from business owners to a World War II fighter pilot, and some of them were still shelling out cash to the scammers just weeks before the trial. During Sanjay's time in court, about a dozen victims testified against against him, both in person and by video, and authorities combed through about 50,000 emails and 500,000 documents, adding to the piles of evidence. After the jury deliberated, the judge dropped the hammer, and Sanjay got hit with a brutal 20-year prison sentence. However, that sentence may be reduced if he cooperates with the investigations into the Jamaican lottery scam, which has been a growing problem. With a sentence that large, it's likely he will. Remember to let your loved ones know that if they didn't play, they definitely didn't win. Number five, fake rich. Neil Casson was a smooth talking con man who fancied himself as a Ferrari driving playboy living large on a supposed 1.25 million pound lottery win. But Neil didn't win any lottery and his life of luxury was built on a towering stack of lies. Neil from Galgate Lancashire in the UK had an act of duping just about anyone he met. He claimed he won big on the national lottery and lovers, financiers, and even business 
businesses fell victim to his grand deception to the tune of over 300,000 pounds. But beneath the thin veneer of a lottery millionaire, Neil was nothing more than a penniless scam artist. His game plan? He hoodwinked unsuspecting investors into his elaborate schemes to import jet skis and sewing machines and promise them riches beyond their wildest dreams. He used the investment money to finance a Ferrari. Cassin's most despicable act, though, was targeting vulnerable women. He sweet-talked them into handing over their life savings, all in the name of get-rich-quick schemes. One woman went as far as selling her house to fund his extravagant lifestyle, a decision she would soon come to deeply regret. Neil's house of cards finally came crashing down when he had a falling out with a friend. The friend, apparently wanting to get back at him for some issue with the business deal, posted a video of Cassin speeding way too fast in his Ferrari. The police caught wind of the video, and Cassin eventually found himself in Preston Crown Court. He couldn't talk his way out of this one either, so he pleaded guilty to 20 counts of fraud. The judge handed down a nearly five-year prison sentence, and for a moment, justice seemed to prevail. But fast forward a couple years later, and Neil was back on the streets. He was on social security because he said he couldn't work, but he still had tricks up his sleeve. Cassin tapped into funds from family members and tried his luck with some bets at the bookies. Neil wagered over 2,000 pounds on UK soccer team Aston Villa's promotion to the Premier League, and he ended up winning. But before he could even enjoy the money, the 5,750-pound jackpot was frozen under the proceeds of Crime Act. The court had to decide if he could keep it. In the end, Neil was ordered to pay £11,000 to his victims, which was pretty much all that remained of the £300,000 he had swindled. And for good measure, the court decided to toss that betting win into the mix too. Cassin said the only way he knew how to make money was by gambling, and he promised he would pay his victims in full if he won. And the fact that he actually said that in court makes us think he didn't learn anything, and that we'll be doing an update real soon. Number 4. Grandma Scammed Imagine being 66 years old, looking forward to your retirement, when suddenly a simple phone call shatters your dreams. That's exactly what happened to Mary Marshall, a great-grandmother from Australia. Mary got a phone call, and on the other end was someone who claimed to be from the Commonwealth Bank Fraud Department. The caller spoke perfect English and knew things about her account that no stranger should. The caller told Mary that her account was tampered with, and to secure her money, she should open a new account and move her cash there. He said she needed to confirm her identity using an app, and when she downloaded it, the scammer cleaned out her savings, taking $13,392 and leaving her just just $2.60. This crook then went on a spending spree with her credit card. Mary, completely freaked out, explained the whole thing to her daughter, Christina, and together they went to the bank. But the bank told Mary that her money was gone. And not only that, but they demanded she pay back all the cash spent by the scammer, including any interest and fees. The bank, in what they somehow thought would be a great PR move, offered her $2,863 to cover the funds, but they wanted $1,616 of that back. Yeah, it's not backbreaking, but geez, if these guys don't have a heart. Mary envisioned a happy retirement, but instead, she was thrust into this nightmare, grappling with a future of uncertainty. What's even sadder is that Mary isn't alone in this kind of ordeal. Scammers often target elderly people who work their entire lives and are now in their twilight years, making them easy targets. And it's not like they can just jump back into the labor force either due to their age. Number three, like father, not like son. In the world of finance, where fortunes are made and lost with the blink of an eye, one Ivy League graduate scheme sent shockwaves through the industry. Andrew Kasperson, a man who took betrayal to a whole new level, defrauding investors of nearly $95 million and leaving a trail of deceit that led to his dramatic arrest. It all started with Kasperson setting up what seemed like a legit investment fund called Irving Place Capital Partners 3 SPV. He had big dreams for it, and and managed to convince people, including private equity firms, friends, family, and even a charity fund, to invest nearly $95 million in this venture. But here's the twist. He also set up another company with a suspiciously similar name, Irving Place 3 SPV LLC, where the money was really going. But instead of making smart investments, Kasperson decided to bet big time on the stock market. And they were high risk bets too, especially on options, contracts related to the S&P 500 index, which became his thing. And guess what? He lost big, real big. Andrew had managed to secure $25 million from unsuspecting investors for his fake fund. But when he went knocking on the door for another $20 million from an old Princeton buddy, that friend got a whiff of 
something fishy. What he uncovered was a web of deception, fake email addresses, shady domain names, and made up financiers, all part of Kesperson's elaborate ruse to cover his tracks. So the friend promptly reported it to the authorities. Kesperson was arrested at New York's LaGuardia Airport, and the investigation revealed that among the people who got swindled were Kesperson's own family, including two of his brothers and even his mom, Barbara, who poured $3 million into what she thought was her son's legitimate fund. And to make matters worse, Kesperson's dad is none other than Finn M.W. Kesperson, a big shot philanthropist and former CEO of Beneficial Group. This guy used to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars before he tragically took his own life in 2009. So the point is, it's not like Kesperson needed the money. Following his arrest, Kesperson was released on $5 million bail, and during this time, he had been cooperating with authorities and offered apologies to his family for losing millions in his fraudulent scheme. In court, Kesperson faced charges of securities and wire fraud, which could lead to a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. Kesperson's betrayal not only shattered the trust of those who knew him, but also exposed the dark underbelly of white-collar crime. In the end, the man who had once been part of an elite circle of Ivy League graduates found himself facing the prospect of a long and uncertain future behind bars. The crazy thing is Kasperson not only came from wealth, but he graduated from Princeton in 99 and Harvard Law School in 2002. The guy had the education and family connections to basically write his own paycheck. You can have all the brains in the world and still be dumb. Number two, confining Mon. Self-proclaimed liberal Sherpa named Kathy Aru used to be a regular guest on Fox News. But things took a seriously dark turn and she's been accused of some pretty heinous stuff. Allegedly, Aru swindled at least $224,000 from her own elderly mom and brace yourselves, quite literally dragged her to a nursing home against her will. Seriously, who does that to their own mom? Here's a little backstory. Aru used to pop up pretty regularly on Fox news shows as a guest, but in 2020, she filed a lawsuit against some heavyweights such as Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson. The lawsuit, which had to do with some alleged harassment, was eventually tossed out by a judge, but that's not where things ended. Apparently, Aru had falsified documents to take control of her mom's home. She even drained money from her mom's reverse mortgage and savings account. Then, she allegedly took out credit cards in her mom's name and used them for her own gain. Aru's Fox News profile was wiped clean after this whole scandal blew up and her liberal Sherpa podcast probably isn't going to be making a comeback anytime soon. But all that wasn't even the worst thing she did. Prosecutors said everything started when they got wind that Aru was exploiting her own mother. One day, she allegedly tricked her mom into thinking they were going out for ice cream with her granddaughters, but instead, she took her to a nursing home using a revoked power of attorney. When her mom tried to call for help, Aru allegedly told the staff not to let her use the phone or see any visitors. Doctors and officials eventually said her mom was competent to make her own decisions, so they sent her back home. But Aru and another person allegedly dragged her mom literally from her house and took her to another facility. And again, she was found competent and sent home. Aru was finally caught and brought to face her numerous felony charges, including exploitation of the elderly, kidnapping, and organized scheme to defraud. Kathy was sent to jail where she was being held without bond, and we wouldn't exactly feel bad if she were actually dragged into jail either. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here to find out just how this guy took advantage of homeless people in New York City to live a life of luxury. Number one, tugging heartstrings. Chrissy Frazier, a retired real estate agent, never thought that an insignificant text message could lead to a significant financial loss. Little did she know that she was about to fall victim to a scam that would cost her over 4,400 pounds. Chrissy was going about her day when a text from her daughter, Camilla, flashed on her screen. Camilla lived in Chicago and Chrissy lived in the UK, so hearing from her was always special. Camilla's message was simple, a request for a roughly 1,200 pound loan. Chrissy had been helping Camilla with the sale of her flat in West London, so helping her out with this seemed like second nature. Chrissy sent the money through her mobile banking app. Camilla continued to chat with her mom about the flat sale, sharing details and asking questions. Everything seemed normal until Camilla said she needed more money, this time £983.20 to cover a late payment fee. Chrissy didn't hesitate and sent over the cash. 
But that wasn't the end of it. Camilla came back, asking for another 2,210 pounds and 44 cents to settle her problems once and for all. Chrissy's motherly instincts kicked in, and she felt compelled to send the money to help her daughter. But as she was about to hit the button for another payment, her bank intervened. Chrissy's account had been frozen due to suspicious activity. At this point, alarm bells started ringing. Chrissy had a gut feeling that something was off. Chrissy decided to make a call to the number Camilla had been texting from, but all she got was a weird screechy noise. Camilla explained it away, saying her speaker was broken, but the feeling in Chrissy's gut just wouldn't go away. The messages from Camilla became even more insistent, almost demanding that Chrissy make the payment. Then, in a brave move, Chrissy told the scammer that she was going to call the police. What followed was unexpected. The scammer actually taunted her with a message and sent a picture of himself out shopping with Chrissy's hard-earned money. Chrissy felt a mix of anger, fear, and betrayal. She had fallen victim to a ruthless scam that preys on parents' love for their children, dubbed the mom and dad scam. This scam hits where it hurts most, the heart. It takes advantage of the natural instinct to help our loved ones, and it leaves victims emotionally shaken and financially drained. In the end, Chrissy was able to get half of her lost money back from Santander, but the experience left her feeling disillusioned. Chrissy believed the bank could have done more to protect her. The story serves as a reminder to always double check before sending money, especially when it comes to family. Scammers are getting smarter, and we all need to protect ourselves and our loved ones. In 2019, Victor Rivera gave himself a raise. He increased his regular salary of $67,000 to a much higher salary of $306,000 per year. Suddenly, Rivera was living a whole different lifestyle. Rivera's most expensive purchase was his house in Stony Point, New York. Stony Point is a small middle-class town outside of New York City. It's not exceedingly wealthy, but offers some upper-class living for those who can afford it. Rivera's Stony Point mansion cost him $780,000. The castle-like home featured a heated pool, a waterfall, and a three-car garage. He also purchased a four-bedroom house in the Poconos Mountains in Pennsylvania. The region is famous for its rolling green mountains and hills. Average Northeasterners vacation there. Wealthy Northeasterners own mountain homes. Robert E. Kittner, former president of ABC and NBC, owns a house in the Poconos. So does former NFL running back James Mungro and the inventor of the heart-shaped bathtub, Morris Wilkins. When he needed a break from running the Bronx network, Rivera and Lynette drove his Mercedes E-Class up to their house in Poconos. If they didn't feel like driving far, they'd go to Stony Point. The Mercedes, which usually retails at $60,000, was paid for by Rivera's shelters. They classified the expense as a company vehicle. Technically, Rivera was using company money to buy all the items mentioned earlier. He also bought his wife a $2,100 Celine Phantom handbag for her birthday. Lynette was so proud of her gift that she posted about it on Facebook. These purchases were so blatant that everyone could tell the Rivera's had money. It was out there for everyone to see, and many people, including a few counselors, knew about Rivera's bizarre spending habits. Nevertheless, Rivera thought he could get away with his lavish spending because of his consultancy businesses. The New York Times published a detailed piece on Victor Rivera in February of 2021. The piece sent shockwaves through New York City as its residents read the horrifying truth about the supposed do-gooder, Victor Rivera. The Times accused Rivera of taking funds from Bronx Network and spending them on personal luxuries. However, their primary accusation, backed up by witness testimonies, was that Rivera had mistreated several of his homeless female tenants. In less than a week, Rivera's life accomplishments came unraveled. He stepped down from Bronx Network, knowing he'd be going to court to face his crimes. However, he wouldn't be legally punished for the mistreatment allegations. The allegations may have destroyed Rivera's reputation, but the financial crimes put him in cuffs. Victor Rivera founded the Bronx Parent Housing Network in 2000. The network focused on housing homeless people suffering on the streets, paving the humble beginning of Rivera's empire. In 2013, the homeless population in New York skyrocketed. Then Mayor Bill de Blasio had to solve a seemingly impossible crisis. He immediately pledged to revitalize the shelter system, which he indeed followed through with. In 2017, de Blasio announced that the city would aim to build 90 shelters in the coming years. This was good news for Rivera. He quickly applied for de Blasio's shelter revitalization project, hoping he'd be accepted. The Bronx network was accepted and received excessive public funding, so much so that Rivera's place in New York society 
changed overnight. Rivera and his wife Lynette, who was also involved in the homeless shelter business, rubbed shoulders with some of the most important bureaucrats. They met these bureaucrats at local charity functions. Rivera and his wife dined with city councilmen and other officials. He even hosted a campaign fundraiser for New York City Councilman Richie Torres, who would later earn a seat in Congress. Rivera had come a long way from a homeless addict wandering the South Bronx. On the surface, he was happily married. He owned a thriving and fulfilling business, and as a bonus, he knew a congressman. It was more than he could have ever imagined, but it wasn't meant to last. Victor Rivera was once the esteemed and proud person who ran 70 homeless shelters and soup kitchens in New York City. Now, he's a convicted felon after pleading guilty to fraud. Rivera provides most of the details about his early life through interviews. In fact, he loved telling everyone from reporters to podcasters about his rags to riches story. Rivera usually starts his story off with his early childhood, how he grew up in the South Bronx. At age nine, he started selling in his neighborhood streets to make ends meet. However, he sold illegal things for a reason. He wanted to avoid going back to a homeless shelter. This survivalist attitude helped Rivera develop a knack for business. For example, Rivera bought two cars before he turned 15. However, he fathered his first child at 15, blaming a drug addiction for his poor choices. Eventually, Rivera's addiction consumed his life and illegal dealing business. It all added up, and Rivera couldn't pay his rent and was forced to live on the streets. He hadn't been homeless since he was a kid. Rivera was arrested one day when an NYPD officer discovered drugs on his person. He spent 1989 and 1990 behind bars after taking drugs while on probation. Rivera's time in prison changed him, he says. Upon his release, Police, Rivera vowed to change his lifestyle and beat his drug addiction. He started working with a low-income housing project in New York for drug addicts. The recovering addict found purpose and drive while working with people struggling with the same things he was. By 2000, Rivera had cleaned himself up. But instead of joining the workforce, Rivera wanted to honor the people who helped him. He did so by starting his own shelter. Bronx Network got off to a rocky start. Rivera struggled to find any public or private funding for most of the 2000s. However, Rivera's fortunes drastically changed in 2012 the year Bill de Blasio was elected mayor of New York. Victor Rivera, according to his tax filings, made $67,000 in 2012, and Bronx Network only brought in $1.1 million in funding revenue. But then, things quickly changed in 2013. Rivera was arrested in March of 2021 by a squad of NYPD officers in New York. The Times wrote a few more articles on Rivera, following his every moment. They kept their eyes on him between his arrest, imprisonment, and courtroom appearances. The media had a field day with Rivera. He was one of the most prominent shelter owners in New York. His downfall wasn't only just a juicy story, but a huge blow to New York City. At the time of his arrest, Rivera owned 70 homeless shelters and soup kitchens. Suddenly, all these shelters were confiscated from Rivera after he resigned from Bronx Network. The collapse of the Bronx Network allowed investigators to dig deeper into Rivera's scam, showing them and the public who revered him and how corrupt the shelter emperor truly was. Rivera set up a system that benefited him far more than his homeless tenants, and it all started with public funding. According to records, U.S. Congressman Richie Torres was Rivera's primary fund provider. He helped Rivera obtain at least a million dollars in public funds via grants from NYC City Council. These grants were awarded to the council's favorite nonprofit organizations, which, thanks to Torres, was usually the Bronx Housing Network. However, Torres and other local officials didn't vote for Rivera's company out of the sheer goodness of their hearts. From 2010 to 2020, Rivera and his wife donated $35,000 to various local officials, according to campaign finance records. Most of that sum funneled into Torres' campaign, given he was the most powerful and influential politician running at the time. Torres released a public statement after the Times piece. He completely ignored the allegations that Rivera had bribed him for public funds. Instead, the newly elected congressman relied on city agencies to vet shelter providers. He never mentioned Rivera, nor did he bring up the Bronx Network. On the other hand, the numbers don't ignore the fact that Torres disproportionately funded the Bronx Network. Rivera's housing company received $274 million in public funding from 2000 to 2020. However, Rivera pocketed most of the money during the 2010s. Rivera owned a consulting business among other entities. However, these entities were only legit on paper. 
In reality, Rivera was using his consultancy company to clean his dirty public funding money. Financial records show that Rivera paid his consultancy company for services using public funds. The Bronx Network was making some big bucks in its heyday. They brought in $80 million a year from public contractors. So Rivera was able to send big chunks of money to himself without compromising the Bronx Network. The consultancy, however, wasn't owned by Rivera, on paper at least. Rivera controlled the companies, but put them under a family member's name. He figured that investigators looking into his financial transactions would only see friendly family-to-family -family business investments. For the most part, Rivera was right. Hardly anyone noticed what he was doing with their tax money. Then, a few brave ex-tenants and employees came forward and told the truth. Former Bronx Network employee Danielle Dawson received $45,000 from Rivera in November of 2017. The money was given to her for one purpose, to make her stop talking. And she wasn't the only one. From 2017 to 2019, Rivera paid two women a combined $175,000. They'd accused Rivera of coercing them into performing highly inappropriate acts. Rivera expected women to do what he wanted at this point in his career. The women he exploited were always under his control in one way or another. Women like Danielle worked for Rivera. They depended on his employment for their livelihood. His other accusers suffered from an even more imbalanced power dichotomy. In 2016, Erica Schuyler was lucky enough to obtain a room at Rivera's apartment complex. Rivera lived there but also used the complex as a homeless shelter. Erica recalls being grateful to finally get off the streets of New York. It was winter and living outside was especially difficult and dangerous. In December 2016, Rivera asked to inspect her room. He claimed that someone said there was a leaky ceiling in Erica's bedroom, but in reality, there wasn't a leak. Erica says Rivera turned off the lights in her bedroom and took advantage of her. Initially, Erica didn't know what to do. She says Rivera threatened to evict her if she didn't do what he said. Erica obeyed him for the time being. She still needed a place to stay after all. However, Erica says she couldn't allow Rivera to get away with mistreating her or any future women who stay at his shelters. After leaving the shelter, Erica reported Rivera to the Times. All in all, 10 women, including Erica, came forward to testify against Rivera. Women like Danielle Dawson allowed the Times access to their horrific stories. Their stories helped bring attention to Rivera, and all this attention brought in the authorities. New York prosecutors accepted Rivera's guilty plea. He pled guilty to money laundering honest service fraud, and honest services fraud conspiracy. Each count carries a 20-year maximum sentence. His sentencing is set for May 6, 2022. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have. A cell phone that you can customize once yourself that lasts a lifetime, or a new cell phone every single year that you don't get to design.